We want to think now about two of Solomon's three books. A Song of Songs, he wrote when young, perhaps with his first love in mind. The Proverbs he wrote in midlife while seeking to guide his family. Ecclesiastes he penned when an old man. We'll think first about Ecclesiastes, meaning the preacher, then look at Solomon's song. In Ecclesiastes, the object of his attention was too small for his heart. In the song, his heart was too small for the object. Now on to Ecclesiastes. What if you had the power, wealth, and position to follow any pursuit? When Solomon came to the throne, he had the resources to push life to the limits. So he did. When a man marries 700 wives, you know he does nothing by halves. Then amazingly, under the direction of the Spirit of God, he wrote his findings and gave his conclusions. What did he try? Just about everything under the sun. One, he searched out intellectualism and the world of thought. What a man knows is the pride of life. Two, he sought out hedonism and the world of thrills. What a man enjoys feeds the lust of the flesh. Three, after these he investigated materialism and the world of things. What a man wants stirs the lust of the eyes. The bottom line, all is vanity. Note the 14 this also is vanity statements in the book. They provide Solomon's outline. But the point is this, without God, life is one big zero. The flaw in human wisdom, it can only find problems, not answers. The problem with temporal pleasures, we must trade a piece of our lives for fleeting pleasures and soon we run out of both. And earthly wealth, when you have a little, it means a lot. But the more you have, the less it means. Until when you have everything, it means nothing. So what are we supposed to do, according to the sermon from the world's wisest man? Number one, remember God is the final judge. Two, remember your creator in the days of your youth. And three, remember this world is too small. Only God is big enough to satisfy our hearts. What a message for our day. The third book by Solomon is one out of a thousand and five songs he wrote, but it's obviously the best, the Song of Songs. It's the greatest love poem ever written about the greatest thing in the world, inspired as it is by God, the greatest person, whose secret name is love. The question is, how is it to be interpreted? It can't just be a naturalistic love song, although we can surely find much here to teach us about wholesome, happy love. To see it allegorically, brings the danger of endless speculation, untethered to the divine purpose. But if all scripture points to Christ, we should be able to understand it typically as the love of the king for his bride. Psalm 45 and this song allow us to compare scripture with scripture, finding good help in our study. Apply it to Christ and refresh your mind on what your beloved is more than another beloved. It should be noted that the name Solomon and the word Shulamite both come from the same root, shalom, or peace. The suffix on the woman's descriptor makes it a term of endearment. But the book can also be understood personally as a handbook for courtship and marriage. Here's a helpful outline provided by my son David. 1, chapter 1 through chapter 3, verse 5. The meeting and relationship. The two meet and build their affection for each other while avoiding the stirring up of love. Two, chapter three, verses six to 11, the marriage. The security and grandeur of the event is evident by the valiant man and his great riches. Three, chapter four, verse one, through chapter five, verse one, the honeymoon. The compliments start at the head and the marriage is consummated with the approval of God. Four, Chapter 5, verse 2 through chapter 6, verse 13. The restoration. The bride sins against the groom by keeping herself from him. He leaves and she receives chastening from the Lord, but they are fully restored. 5, chapter 7 and 8. The traits of a faithful relationship. Their faithfulness has endured and their love continues. If in fact the story between the shepherd king and the Shulamite is meant to express both the ways of love between a godly man and the wife of God's favor 
and at the same time a picture of his love between the Lord and his people. What a shocking thing this is. Do you know what this means? The most surprising idea in this little book, full of surprises, is this. The relationship between once rebellious, failing sinners and our perfect and princely Lord, now that we are his, can be described best through the intimacy, devotedness, and oneness of marriage. Is it true? Yes, by grace it is, and we should never lose the wonder of it. The tale of Cinderella and the Prince is nothing compared to this. In the words of Samuel Rutherford, Christ's love for us has no brim nor bottom. We are loved more than we can imagine, and we are as secure in that love as the unchanging character of God and the unchangeable Word of God can make us. And that's our slightly longer scripture snapshot of Ecclesiastes and the Song of Solomon.